Happy Sabbath. Are you really happy? Or do we just say that we're happy? Sometimes when we get asked Happy Sabbath, it's just the, the answer you give. Happy Sabbath. God wants us to be happy people. God does not want us to be sad people. He wants us to be happy. But the problem we have is that we aren't happy with the way in which God wants to make us happy. We all want to be happy as an end result, but the path in which leads to happiness, we're not happy with. And because we're not happy with that path, we're not happy. And therefore, we don't think that that path will lead us to happiness. But if we live by faith and not by sight, it will lead to happiness. And we want to consider today the path that the Lord has for us to be happy. And perhaps as we go through this, we might realize that we aren't really happy with that way. But if we are going to be happy with the way the Lord will lead us to happiness, we will be happy even before we get to happiness. Because we know where we're going. Faith is probably the biggest element, is the biggest element that we need in order to be able to be stable Christians. And God has given us his word and he has fulfilled all our needs but the reason why this world is not happy is because they don't recognize their needs as fulfilled by the Lord in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 it tells us of something that is not good for man. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. And in this verse it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an helpmeet for him. What does the Almighty say? The person who just created by everything he said, he spoke and it was done. He made statements and they appeared in creation. And then he made a statement, it is not good for man to be alone. So is that true today? Is it good for man to be alone? God had said that it is not good for man to be alone. And as he made this statement, then we read in verse 19 that the Lord, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field, but for Adam... There was not found an helpmeet for him. So here God says it is not good for man to be alone. And then Adam goes through an experience of going through all the creatures and seeing that each creature has a male and female. There is a helpmeet for each creature. And then after he has gone through his, his um, business of naming all the animals and observing all these things, he comes to a conclusion that there was no one for him. And God said it wasn't good for that to be. It is not good for man to be alone. Loneliness is a big problem. Because can you be really, really happy when you're alone? When you're lonely? I mean, you might have lots of people around you, but you might have that empty feeling that I'm alone. And this world, to a huge degree, suffers from this problem. And that is the factor of 
unhappiness. I read from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46. It says, Man was not made to dwell in solitude. He was to be a social being. Without companionship, the beautiful scenes and the and beautiful employments of Eden would have failed to yield perfect happiness. Even commune with angels could not have satisfied his desire for sympathy and companionship. There was none of the same nature to love and to be loved. Often people think, you know, if I had all these possessions, I would be happy. You know, no one ever possessed more beauties and and treasures than Adam did when the world was created. He ruled the world uncontestedly. He had everything at his hands that this world has to offer. And yet, he couldn't be perfectly happy because the word of the Lord has says it is not good for man to be alone. Man was not created to live in solitude. Man was not created to just be on their own. And so he longed for someone of the same nature. The angels, they were companions, but they were of a different nature. To love and to be loved. God himself gave Adam a companion. He provided an helpmeet for him, a helper corresponding to him. One who was fitted to be his companion and who could be one with him in love and sympathy. Eve was created from the rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal, to be loved and protected by him, a part of man, bone of his bone, and flesh of his flesh. She was his second self, showing the close union that the affectionate attachment and the affectionate attachment that should exist in this relation. So this relation was to have affection, to be able to love and be loved back, to have sympathy. Now, sympathy is where two people have the same experience or the same feelings. Empathy is where we acknowledge intellectually the person's suffering. And so man didn't need someone to, be, to have empathy to just acknowledge, yeah, you're in that situation and I have some mental... Um, compassion for you just from a, um, an intellectual basis, but needed someone to actually have the same experience that knows the same feeling, that are in harmony together. That's what man needed. And without this, man cannot be perfectly happy. So these are the needs you know, these aren't just wants. These are our needs for our social makeup. Companionship, sympathy, someone to love and be loved, a helper, and to have harmony. That is what each of us need. And because it's a need, we search for it, do we not? In Acts of the Apostles, page 491, it says, The desire for love and sympathy is implanted in the heart by God Himself. Who put it there? Who put it there, that desire to have companionship? That desire to have somebody by my side, to be my helper, to know what I'm going through, to be able to understand me? Who put that desire there? God Himself put it there. And so when we get inadequate levels of social relations, a dreadful feeling of em emptiness and solitude 
start, and that is called loneliness. When we do not get that need. Have you ever been hungry? Why do you get hungry? Because you don't have the need. Do you need food? Is it a need? Has that been planted there by God? Absolutely. And when you don't get enough food, do you feel empty? <laughs> Absolutely. And do you start looking for food? Yeah. Do you ever get thirsty? And when you're thirsty, do you have that desire to have water? Do you start looking for it? Well, this is the same. Just like our physical body needs food and water, so our social needs are met by what God has instituted by a companion. Someone to bestow sympathy, love, that will receive love back. Loneliness can also be described as social pain. Social pain. Where you can be in a relationship, you can have somebody, and yet you receive pain from them. And you feel lonely. You can be, you can be next to a thousand people and be lonely. That there's no one there. And so social pain can result into bitter actions. We become bitter. Just like if someone was deprived from their food long enough, there is a reaction that comes out that is not generally nice. That was seen in the besiege of Jerusalem. This religious nation of Jews, when held back from food, they started doing awful things. There was great bitterness in that experience. So this loneliness or social pain has come to each one of us, whether we acknowledge it or not, we've all, we've all had it. In fact, soon as sin entered, how was this beautiful relationship that God made between Adam and Eve after sin, how was that relationship? Was it what it was before sin? Not at all. There was bl the blame game. The woman you gave me, she, she did this. And is that love? Not at all. And then the children, the two brothers, were there love between them? Cain and Abel? Was there sympathy between the two? Was there harmony? This is just the first generation. And there was a murder. Do you think we're any better today? Or do you think we're worse? This thing has perpetuated. We have, since sin has entered, we suffer the, the, the neglect or the, the loss of the social need that God has instilled into each one of us. Loneliness can happen in childhood. Children can be lonely. When children are neglected, they may have someone in the room with them, but when they're neglected for, for personal character training with the parent, that one-on-one -on -one contact, when children are neglected that, they get lonely. And when they get lonely, they get social pain. And that results in bitter action. And little children play up to get attention because the policy is some attention is better than no attention. And then we wonder, why are the children the way they are? Because they have a social need. When, when anything of our needs are deprived, we have great temptation to fall into bad behavior. When a child doesn't get fed, they start playing up. When they get underslept, they start playing up. Any need, and that includes the social need. In childhood, often the pain that comes because of the parents' neglect, they seek other companionship. 
Just like we would seek food when we're hungry, so children, when neglected, seek another place to supply the need that they have. A need to have love and be loved and to have sympathy and understanding. And so they might go to their auntie's house. And their auntie did bestows upon them sympathy and love. And they want to be there. They don't want to be with their parents. And then when they go to school, perhaps, it, perhaps someone in the world shows them some th- sympathy. And bit by bit, the children are taken away from the home. And they find relationships as they grow older. And the quest of seeking to have this need fulfilled goes into adolescence in the childhood loves. That this person, we have the same interests. We, we're a match. And so they connect and they receive their need. But there's disappointments in that also. There are disappointments in marriage. You know, people can look who are not married, who are single, and look over the fence at married people and said, if I had that, I would be happy. But there are people in marriage who lie in the same bed together but are miles and miles apart from each other. They're from one end of the universe to the other, it feels like, because they've drifted apart. And the need is not a physical need. It is sympathy It is love. It is these elements that we crave for. And when people go into marriage and it fails, the Bible says that this hope deferred, what does it do? It makes the heart sick. Because the heart is sick, they start to do strange things. Do you do strange things when you're sick? mentally sick and so they break the marriage divorce happens and they just think well perhaps it was that person themselves that wasn't the match for me i'll look for somebody else always believing that there is somebody in this world that is going to totally satisfy this need i have and this need is planted in my heart from god himself And some think, well, if I have a child, I can love this child and the child will love me back. And I can always be with this child and it will grow and it will be what I've been looking for. And there are many mothers who bestow this, who, who look into their infants, to their children for the need that they have. But after a baby's born... People fall into postpartum depression where hmm, it's not what I want. They're waking me up all the time and it's just me giving and I don't get anything back. And there can be this depression and the husband perhaps isn't supportive or isn't maybe not even there. And so there is more emptiness than ever before. These are the problems that we face today. And these situations are all over the world. I read here from Adventist Home, page 79. Adventist Home, page 79. It says, Attachments formed in childhood have often resulted in very wretched unions or in disgraceful separations. Early connections, if formed without the consent of parents, have seldom proved happy. A youth, not out of his teens, is a poor judge of the fitness for a person, of a person as young as himself to be his companion for life. After their judgment has become more matured, they view themselves bound for life to each other, and perhaps not at all calculated to make each other happy, then instead of making the best of their lot, recriminations take place. The breach widens until there is a settled indifference and a neglect of each other. 
To them, there is nothing sacred in the word home. The very atmosphere is poisoned by unloving words and bitter reproaches. This problem reflects back on itself because if I have been disappointed by my needs not being filled, if I don't have that need that was put in me by God, supplied, I can become bitter back to people. Now the person I become bitter to also has the same need that I needed. And they're also looking for love and in their search for love they receive bitter from my own hand. And then they are disappointed. And in their disappointment, they give bitterness out. And you can see a chain reaction that will go from every situation of life, from the beginning of the fall to this day, that there has been bitter words exchanged from people. There has been people seeking for this, this companionship and failing to find it. And so there are many marriage that is more bitter than someone dwelling alone. What does the Bible say about that? Proverbs 21.19 says it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious or angry woman. Now this doesn't just apply with man to woman. It's either way. To dwell where your needs are not being supplied, it's better to be alone with nobody than to look for somebody for the, for the hopes and getting it failed. We become very clever at covering it all up and making life the best we can. And we often bottle up these things and our marriage might appear quite alright to the world. We might consider, well, we don't really have huge domestic blues or anything and our words really aren't bitter. But there is in many, many marriages a disappointment in some way or another that the person has let me down. And we might express this disappointment to somebody and then they would promise, oh, I promise. And we start making promises to each other. And we promise to each other to do certain things and those promises are like ropes of sand. They fail. And when every promise especially in young marriages where a promise is made that I will be better and I'll make sure that, that I'll love you and, and promises are exchanged. And then when they fail, it's a mockery. It's an absolute mockery of the trust that was put in the person who made the promise. And as that mockery is, is um, acknowledged, then well, let's just, I'll just be by myself. I'll just close up and you do your thing and I'll do my thing. And that's how the marriage functions. But not all marriages are like that. Some marriages actually do break up. And men might look for some other source of love. And it's a fact that loneliness increases internet usage loneliness increases internet usage so when i'm lonely i might get onto my facebook and there are so many people that are on social networking sites because they're lonely and they are looking, not purposefully necessarily, but there is an underlying need that they look for sympathy and love. And as Christians, we should be very careful how we behave on social networking sites. Because the world 
are lonely and it is a statistical fact that with loneliness, internet gets used more. That is a fact. And if there are then a lot of lonely people on these sites, should we be careful how we use this world? Can we abuse this world? It says in my life today that the lips were constantly guarded, if the lips were constantly guarded so that no guile would corrupt them, what amount of suffering, degradation and misery might be prevented? If we would say nothing to wound or grieve, except in necessity of reproving, the, except in necessarily re, necessary reproof of sin, what uh, that God might be dishonoured. Sorry, if we would say nothing to wound or grieve, God would not be dishonoured. How much misunderstanding, bitterness, and anguish would be prevented? If we would speak words of good cheer, words of hope and faith in God, how much light might be shed upon the pathway of others if to be reflected still brighter beams upon my own soul? If we, as Christians, go on to social networking sites and purposely stir people up, we're doing God dishonour. Great dishonour. If we think that we can get there and give sharp statements to people just to rile them up, when people on there are searching for some fulfilment, and they go into wrong paths and all sorts of sites that sh we should never go into, but they're all looking for their need. They're looking for a bit of food for their social fabric. And if we would give Love and sympathy in everything we communicate to people, it will come back to us. Because often the most bitterest people are those that give bitter bitterness. And if we, if we desire not to be lonely, if we desire not to have the bitterness, we must bestow sympathy and love that comes from God's word. That's what we must do. We must... If we would speak words of good cheer, words of hope and faith, how much light might be shed upon the pathway of others? If we would stop riling people up and come to the point of sharing the beauty of Jesus. And if people aren't interested, if you get less reaction, fine. Don't worry. But this love will be reflected back on me. And then my life might not be so miserable. And so that's if we take seriously our calling as God's workers, that we will not engage in this any longer. But there are people who, through bitter marriages or bitter relationships that have broken up, they're still longing for some expression. And many people fall into adultery. Not purposely that they're such wicked people. Because we treat adultery like, like the biggest crime in the world. you know what the biggest crime in the world is? Religious pride. Religious pride is the biggest sin that has caused the biggest suffering. But Jesus said in his day, who were closer to the kingdom of heaven? The publicans and harlots were closer to the kingdom of heaven than the Pharisees and those that thought themselves quite all right, rich and increased with goods and of need of nothing. I have my social needs met because I'm at the top of the ladder. No, there are people that are longing, that are hungering and thirsting. And the Bible says, blessed are they. But there are dangers. And let's read one in Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7. In Proverbs chapter 7, we read, starting in verse 10. This is speaking about a harlot. But notice here it says in, in 10, verse 10, 
Proverbs 7, verse 10. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. Now, notice verse 11, what the Bible has to say about her in her private life. Verse 11, she is loud and, and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. So here is this, this person with a facade. They have this pretending picture upon them. And, and, but yet the Bible says that they are loud and stubborn person. But notice how the, the front is displayed. Now she is without, now in the streets and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him. And with an imprudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day I have I paid my vows. Therefore, come, therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I found thee. Here's a person who directly comes to a person who is obviously um, having a need of at least some social need. And this person comes and says, I've come just for you. <laughs> just you. I just love you. But yet at home, she's not like this at all. She's stubborn and loud. There's this front. And in this front, she, makes, she pretends that she's just interested in the person. Now, how does that feel when someone comes to you and tells you that they really like just you? You're very special to them. Is that what we need? That's part of our need to feel this, to be loved and to love. Oh, someone actually likes me. You know, people say, I'm lonely. Will anyone talk to me? And someone comes and, and speaks, just, I want to just talk to you. And so there is, a f there is a hope coming up. Oh, maybe this is the answer to my needs. This is what I've been looking for. Someone to love me. And so I can love them back. And then it says, I have decked my bed with coverings and tapestry with carved works of fine linen. I have perfumed my bed with, with myrrh, aloes and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver. As a bird hasteneth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O children, and attend unto the words of my mouth. Let not thy heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Now, we could say, this doesn't apply to me because I don't run down to the brothel every night. It's got nothing to do with me. This Bible text shows the way in which she will seduce. And what way is it? With much fair speech. A lot of flattering words. We call that sweet nothings, where you whisper in the ear all these lovely things and really they don't mean anything. And the person is absolutely f taken by the lovely sentiments that is expressed in word. V audible word coming into my ear and, and I feel great. And this is the way. Now, we might have a genuine marriage or anything, but if we are dependent upon these flattering things to come into my ear to satisfy my need, the Bible says that particular way is the way to hell. Many men or women have been caught by such flattery that actually mean nothing because the home life is stubbornness and, and uh, noisiness. But you don't know until you get into the house, until you get into the marriage, until you marry them. And then all of a sudden it's just totally different. So here's the point. 
Are we reliant upon audible, uh, a physical person, audible noise of love that will stimulate my feelings? Are that, is that what we're dependent on for our need? We want to consider that a bit further, but we will touch on that later on. And so, because of the want of needs in a marriage, people can wander looking for other people and the flattering words and the, and the imagery and everything captures people. Because we're dependent on our social needs and we look for them through our eyes and through our ears. Adventist Home, on page 80, it says... Neither physical health, sorry, immature marriages are productive of the most the, of a vast amount of evil that exists in the world exists today. Neither physical health nor mental vigor is promoted by a marriage that is entered into too early in life, and not just too early in life, but just premature. That it wasn't God led; it was my own senses that were telling me. And so, this problem affects the physical frame. So, if we are suffering from loneliness, do you know that will come out in bodily ailments? When we have our social needs and they're not met and we have a great emptiness, we will get physically sick. That's what it read. That physical, from Adventist Home, Neither physical health nor mental vigor is promoted by this sort of marriage. We get run down. And in that, we, this bitterness really comes out. And we, we're just disappointed. We had great hopes. And man has failed in supplying my needs. And because he's failed to supply my needs, I'm going to get bitter and I won't supply his. And this comes, mental disease comes from loneliness. It's called depression. And is depression a problem today? Huge, huge problem today. So the Bible tells us that we should not, when we have all been disappointed from our expectations from our, the person that we have trusted to give out my social needs, whether it be a husband or wife or whether it be a friend or anybody, we're looking for our need and when it's not supplied, we get bitter. And the Bible says in Colossians chapter, one, uh, chapter 3, sorry, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8 and 9. Colossians 3, sorry, 18 and 19. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. This bitterness in marriage isn't just on the man's part, it can be on the woman's part. The Bible says don't be bitter against them. Because we have occasion, if we are looking for the needs in our marriage partners or in friends, we have occasions in some point or another to be bitter. We will. The Bible says don't be bitter against them. Sure, they won't supply your needs, but don't be bitter against them. The Bible also says in, he, in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. 
looking diligent lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. How many? Many people are defiled if I harbour a root of bitterness or a disappointment or a little bit of sourness at someone else's action or I have been disappointed clearly by somebody else and I'm going to I'm going to get back at them somehow. I might I might just withdraw some of their some of their needs. I've been withdrawn my needs. I'm going to withdraw their needs. The Bible says this is how many people are defiled. Many people. Because my needs aren't supplied, I'm going to cut the other person off to a certain degree and punish them for doing this to me. This bitterness. This is this is all what makes life bitter. And we feed ourselves instead of from the love of God, we get bitter, we lock up, and we go and feed ourselves on the news feed on Facebook. Just to, to seek for something to just stimulate my mind on social things. And we go through and we just feed on it in our minds. But is that good food? The news feed? Not at all. That's the worst food you could ever eat in your need. Other people can turn to social gaming where they can have a virtual reality of life and interact with other people on a cyber reality and spend all their time in a fake world because this world is so bitter. But my friends... We've all come to a bitter place. We've all come to bitter waters. And there is a tree that is standing by the same waters. And it needs to be cut down and put into the water. The solution for our bitter experience isn't to go to another place to find sweet water. We're not to travel somewhere else and find a sweeter circumstance. We aren't to go and find a sweeter person to enjoy my time with. Right in the bitter experience, there is the answer right there. We want to look at this. Turn with me to, to Exodus. Exodus chapter 15. Exodus 15, we're reading verse 22 through to 25. 22 to 25. Whoops, I'm in the wrong book. Fifteen twenty-two to 25. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Is that a need? Okay. When we come into the wilderness and we get desperate for relationships, there's no need. I ne have a need. And so we'll take anything that comes, but it proves to be bitter. It's called desperation. It says, And when they came to Marah, they went... They could not drink of the water of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah, which means bitter. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast, cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an audience, uh, ordinance, and there he proved them. So if you've had any bitter experiences in your life, or not necessarily just bitter, but disappointments, you go to this water, great! Oh, it's terrible. It's not what I was needing. There is a tender plant. There's a root that has come out of dry ground. And when he has been sacrificed, and has been placed into those bitter experiences of yours, they will not just come neutral, 
they will become sweet. Don't settle for second best, my friends. Don't just settle for a marriage that's pretty good. That's quite neutral. It's not, it's not bitter. But it has its, you know, it's not bad. Don't settle for that. There is sweet water to be had, my friends. There is sweet relationship to be had. But it's not travelling somewhere else. It's not going to a Caribbean island to have some coconuts and some lovely holiday. That's not where it is. It's right here in the bitter water with the application of this tender plant. This root that comes out of dry ground has to be cut and put into the waters. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. says, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who's going to believe it? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, that when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You know, if you came to those waters, what if you looked at that tree and went, that's the answer. That to your bitter waters? Not at all, it's just a tree in the wilderness. But it says he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him he was despised and we esteemed him not surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of god and afflicted he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. The healing of the waters. With his stripes, we will be healed. Whose griefs did he bear? Your griefs, my griefs. It wasn't similar to my griefs. It was my griefs he bore. My sorrows. He bore your sorrows. He bore. And the Bible says that he bore our sins where? In his body. On the tree. So this is an internal experience and not something similar to what I go through. Some, something that's like it in the, way of, um, in the way of the form of. But it is it itself. Because the Bible says that he has borne my griefs and carried my sorrows. The Bible also says in Isaiah 63 that of the people, there was none with him. He trod the winepress alone. He was by himself. Why did, he, why did the king of glory, who has all the social activities that you could ever want, become lonely? Because he wants to be lonely with you. If you're lonely, the solution to your loneliness is not, not being lonely. It's being lonely with him. And you can be lonely without being lonely. Desire of Ages, page 422, states this. Bearing the weakness of humanity. Desire of Ages 422. Bearing the weakness of humanity and burdened with its sorrows and sins, Jesus walked alone in the midst of men. As the darkness of the coming trial pressed upon him, he was in loneliness of spirit. In a world that knew him not, even his loved disciples, absorbed in their own doubt and sorrow and ambition and ambitious hopes had not comprehended the mystery of his mission he had dwelt amid the love and fellowship of heaven but in the world that he had created he was in solitude 
He came unto his own and his own didn't receive him. He had people there. He had a, he had a, a group of friends. But you know what? Friends do not satisfy the need. They can't. And so Christ was alone. He had the disciples. They loved him. But they didn't understand him. And if they understand him, can they sympathize with him? No. They couldn't supply that need for him. Now heaven had sent his... And now this is on the transfiguration. He received Moses and Elijah. And it says of Elijah, Elijah had no loneliness of spirit. As for three years and a half of famine, he had borne the burden of nation, nation's hatred and its woes. Alone he stood for God upon Mount Carmel. Alone he fled to the desert in anguish and despair. These men chosen above angels around the throne had come to commune with Jesus concerning the scenes of his suffering. Jesus was alone and he was really alone. And could the angels comfort him for what was coming? Elijah. Elijah knew what it was like to be alone. He needed human sympathy. Not angelic sympathy. He needed human sympathy. And so Moses and Elijah were there to strengthen, to supply the need for Christ. But it also says in Desire of Ages, page 687, 687, Paragraph 3, the human heart longs for sympathy. This longing Christ felt to the very depths of his being. In his supreme agony of his soul, he came to his disciples with a yearning desire to hear some words of comfort from those who he had so often blessed and comforted. He had supplied their need. He could sympathize with them. And now he came to them wanting something back. Jesus bore our griefs. And carries our sorrows. Jesus could have been bitter. He could have gone, forget you guys. I've been here for you all this time and now you're not here for me. He could have said that. And he came there needing, having a need. This desire to the very depth of his being. I need somebody to understand what I'm going through. Just to give me some comfort at least. Just a little bit. The one who had always had words of sympathy... For them was now suffering superhuman agony and he longed to know that they were praying for him and for themselves. How dark seemed the malignity of sin. Terrible was the temptation to let the human race bear the consequences of its own guilt while he stood innocent before God. If he could only know that his disciples understood and appreciated this, he would be strengthened. And so Hebrews chapter 2 in verse 14 to 18. Hebrews chapter 2, 14 to 18. Just turn there. Jesus Christ did all this voluntarily. He didn't have to. He did this so he can understand you and me. It says Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. To 18, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took upon him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things, how many things? In all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. That's why he did it. He was alone, so you don't have to be alone. So he can not just have empathy for you, that he understands by intellect what you're going through, but that he can have sympathy. The great physician, 
You know, in the world, it's unprofessional for a physician to have sympathy. They are taught you can only have empathy. It's unprofessional to get too involved in the patients. But Jesus, our great physician, wasn't professional like that. He came down to you and me and touched us where we are in our experience. And so in all our trials, in all our trials, we have a never-failing helper. Desire of Ages, page 483. He does not leave us alone to struggle with temptation, to battle with evil, and to be finally crushed with the burdens and sorrows. Though now he be hidden from mortal sight, the ear of faith can hear his voice saying, Fear not, I am with you. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I have endured your sorrows, experienced your struggles. Whose struggles? Yours. Not, this is so important that we understand this. Because some people say, you know, Jesus doesn't really know what you're going through. And if that's the case, then I can't serve him. Because he doesn't supply my needs. But here, the truth of the matter is that he became one with me. In my condition. He knows my struggles. He has encountered your temptations. Who did that? Do you believe that? Who hath believed his report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He has not left us alone to struggle with temptation, to battle with evil, and to be finally crushed with burdens and sorrows. He says, I know your tears. I also have wept the griefs that lie too deep to be breathed into any human ear. I know. Think not that you are desolate and forsaken, though your pain touch no responsive cord in any heart on the earth. Look unto me and live. Though the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall my covenant of peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. The Bible text says, Look diligently, lest any root of bitterness spring up, and whereby many are defiled. If we don't find in Jesus Christ this reality, we will always be bitter for the rest of our lives because marriage was only a symbol of what Jesus wanted to engage with us. And so people can look to marriage as the answer because he says it's not good for man to be alone and he gave Eve to Adam. But Eve didn't fill the needs of Adam after the fall. I need a helpmeet, someone who can have sympathy with me. And the answer is in Jesus, to have fellowship in his sufferings. That's Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. So many times we grapple with the thing that we find is fulfilling our need. We hold on to relationships. At the cost of the relationship with Jesus. We say, I'll not let my child go to follow the Lord. I want my child or my loved one. I don't want to have a separation of my family. I love them so much because they are supplying my needs. But they're not supplying your needs properly. You'll be undernourished. And so we, we often say no to Jesus because the path of his happiness we're not happy with. We look for the audible noise, the physical hand to touch my skin. But does that do anything? Can a harlot do that? Of course. We read that was the way. And what way was that? When we're dependent on the physical audible noise in my ear and the physical touch of another human... 
that that supplies my need. But has it supplied the need of this world? Is this world happy with the relationship of human to human? Not at all. There's a problem with that. And everyone just needs to open our eyes and look around this world and see that this answer to the solution is not found in physical, human, earthly affections in the way of another fallen creature. Our affections must be set where? Where is our scripture reading, was it? Set your affections not on things on earth, but on things in heaven. Because in the new earth, will there be marriage? People can't handle that. There'll be no marriage. My needs won't be supplied. Has marriage supplied your needs? Not at all. If we be honest with ourselves, they haven't. Marriage hasn't supplied our need. Jesus will, and will Jesus be in heaven? Absolutely. That's what makes heaven heaven. And so Philippians 3 verse 10 tells us that we are to know the the power of his resurrection here in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his what? Of his sufferings. How do I have fellowship? Is fellowship something social? That's it. We want fellowship. It's social. We want social activity. And here the Bible is introducing a social activity in the bitter experience. And what social activity is that? That I will have fellowship with him? Yes, with him, but how? In his sufferings. Not on a Caribbean island. It's in the bitter water. And so it states here, from one SAT, and I've forgotten what it stands for in the Spirit of Prophecy, page 132, paragraph 1, it says, We have felt him in his humiliation. We have felt him in the sacrifice. We have felt him in the trials. We have felt him in the tests. Now that we may behold him, that we may see him as he is, that we may behold his glory. And if we behold him, we shall be partakers with him of his glory. When do we feel him? In the suffering. So the suffering I'm feeling, guess what I'm feeling? I'm feeling the heart of Jesus. Why? Is it really the heart of Jesus? If, if my feelings, if my, my sorrow and grief was laid on him, and so he had my grief and my sorrow. So then when I feel my grief and my sorrow, whose grief am I feeling? His, because he had mine. And so when I go through these experiences, if I dwell on this is actually the heart of Jesus right here hurting. And I go out to him in sympathy. Doesn't that, isn't that what he needs? And do I need that? Because what are the needs for humanity? A companion. Someone to show sympathy. If he has taken my feelings, can he give me sympathy? Absolutely he can. And can I love him? Is he in need of my love? He is. He looked to the disciples and said, I need some love here. Because he's man. And he came, just like he got hungry, just like he got thirsty. He had social needs. And he is looking to you and to me to fill those needs. Because he wasn't in ha- He had all of heaven, all of the angelic host. But you know, it was nothing to be desired while humanity was lost. And he was lonely. Because he made him after his image. And so he went to Calvary and from his side poured forth water and blood so he could have a bride. So he could have a people to him that would sit with him on his throne to be equal with him. Wow, equal with him? The Bible says that my God shall supply all your needs. How many needs? 
My God shall supply all your needs. How? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Every need we have. And we grapple onto the things that we think are supplying our needs. We do things to people and people love what we do and we hang on to the thing that we do as the source of giving people they can love me because I do certain things. You know, a wife in the house might be a really good cook and so she, she cooks a dish and the husband loves it. And then after a while, there is a temptation to hang on the action of cooking to get the love from my husband. And if I don't cook her a good dish, then it's terrible. Or we can be in the service of Christ and we can do things in Christ's church. And we can say, if I do these things, then I'm of value. And if I don't get to do these things, then what am I worth? I'm worth nothing. And we throw up our hands in the air and think that we're of no value. My friends, did Christ come to save you just because you're a good cook? Just because you could do some great evangelistical work? Did Christ come just because you were talented in something and says, yeah, I'll get you because you're great. You'll make, a, you'll make a good partner for me. No, he came and he bestowed love. He didn't bestow bitterness. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world and to bestow upon it his love in order to get love back. Because it is only by love that love is awakened. And so never think that occupying a, a controversial approach in missionary work will ever accomplish anything. It won't. Because only by love is love awakened. And love is the fulfilling of the law. And if I don't show love, I'm causing people to break God's commandments. If I'm bitter. Now, how can I open myself up to another human relationship that hurts me and not retaliate? I have to have my needs supplied by Jesus Christ. Because if my needs are supplied, then if other people don't supply them, will I get bitter with them? Not at all. I won't get bitter with them. They can make a promise. They can break their promise. They can do something in the marriage or in a relationship that will disappoint me. But I'm not disappointed because Jesus hasn't disappointed me. And so this relationship is purely by faith. Faith I live by, page 123. We want to understand that this relationship that we have with Christ has to be of a different caliber to the one that we rely on in the physical sense. It says, our Saviour wants you, in page 123 of Faith I Live By, our, faith, our Saviour wants you to keep in close relation to Himself. He wants you close. Why? That He may make you happy. Jesus wants to make you happy. Are you happy? Is it a happy Sabbath today? Are you really happy? Is Jesus making you happy? How does He do it? When Christ lets his blessing rest upon us, we should offer thanksgiving and praise to his dear name. But you say, or I say, if I could only know that he was my saviour, well, what kind of evidence do you want? Do you want a special feeling or an emotion to prove that Christ is yours? Is that more reliable than pure faith? Is that more reliable than pure faith in God's promises? Would it not be better to take the blessed promises of God and apply them to yourself, bearing your whole weight upon them? This is faith. We look, in, in our walk with the Lord, we look for the feelings of the emotions to prove that He loves me. But just think about that. In the world, when we look to one another for the feeling to prove of love, what does it do to the marriage? Is it a good marriage or a bad marriage if we're relying on just the motion of each other? It doesn't work because everyone lets everyone down. So when we come to Christ, we want to be happy in our own way. We say, Lord, I'll love you if you speak to me audibly. If you put your arm around me and give me the warm fuzzies, then I'll love you back. But no, Jesus says it's by faith. I have spoken and I mean what I say. And I want you to trust what I say because this is the only sure foundation because your feelings will change. Your feelings will be like the, like the ocean up and down. 
And when the heavens and earth depart, how will you feel about that? Our feelings, our feelings will be all over the shop. But what we feel or how we feel is none of our business. Do you know what our business is? To be about the Father's business. We are to be about what God says. This is our business, is God's word. And what God's word says, it is. And I'm going to hang on it. And I'm going to pray with all the intensity of my desire to him who can hear me because he said he can hear me. And he doesn't lie. His promises do not fail. This, my friends, is the source of happiness. And if we aren't happy to go through this way to happiness, we will not be happy. And if you want to find another way to happiness, try it. It will never work because there is no happiness in this world without him. We will only be bitter. And so, Jesus has said, I will not leave you orphans. I will comfort you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He also says, my Father and I will make our abode with you. Now, this is not just something with no ex evidence. Faith has evidence. And if you would go out on a limb and take God at his word... And claim the promises, feeling or no feeling, you will make an exper experience. Ex exper um, an experience. If you do this experiment. And that is found in five testimonies. It says, five testimonies, 221. How shall we know for ourselves God's goodness and his love? How are we going to know? The psalmist tells us, not hear and know, not read and know or believe and know, but taste and see. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Instead of relying upon the word of another, taste for yourself. Make an experiment in your loneliness. In your experiment, when you're lonely, don't hop onto Facebook. Don't hop onto some other social networking. Get into your Bible. And pray to the Lord and find Jesus. Make an experiment. Don't worry about your feelings. Don't feel that it's a waste of time. Don't worry about that. Make an experiment and call out on the name of the Lord. Call to the name of the Lord and he will hear you in your loneliness. And he knows that you're lonely. He knows that you'll go through a bitter thing. But blessed bitter experience. Because that makes us desire the sweet. And there is a testimony in mind character and personalities that says that it is for our good that we feel lonely don't try and crowd the loneliness out with all the music and get your mind bombarded with just information just to crowd out your loneliness be still and know that i am god says the lord take that time experience the loneliness and find what jesus experienced and say hey we're lonely together we're in it together. This bitterness is together. And as we dwell on that, not in five minutes, not in ten minutes, but dwell on it in time, you will find that Jesus is your companion. You will experience, you will taste that the Lord is good. Don't trust the words of other people and just leave it at that. Experience it. Knowledge is derived from experiment. Experiment. Er, experimental religion is what is needed now. Taste and see that the Lord is good. For we are bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. And so, if he is our head, if he is our husband then he will give the sympathy and the love and we can love him back and the harmony and the help that we need. This is my prayer that we will not hang on to things that make us feel valuated, things that make us feel of worth. Let us leave them. Not doesn't say don't do them anymore, but let's leave them as the source of my need and let us kneel before the Lord and call upon his name. For he will hear, for he has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You will never be alone. And he was. So he knows. If you feel alone, he knows. So you're not alone. I pray that we can take this on board as practice.
Taste and see. Amen.